Mom, Dad, there's no way that I can express to you what I'm feeling right now. My heart is full to bursting, except to say, I'm the king of the world! Hello and welcome back to Cameron King of the World. This time we're going to be talking about The Abyss Special Edition. The special edition release of the film that reinstated almost half an hour's worth of deleted scenes from the theatrical version and what I think of it. Um, the kind of history of this cut comes from Aliens. Uh, successfully being given a re-release. I think um, I'm trying to remember the dates now because I did that the, that big kind of hyper-focused three videos on Aliens and I've already forgotten the dates, but I think that the once Aliens had been completed and a, a large chunk of scenes had been cut from the film, Cameron then went back and put those scenes back in and his special edition cut of Aliens went out on TV in 1989. And then in 1990, um, it was released in the UK. 1991, I think, or 1992, it was released in the States on Laserdisc with a nice special edition. And so that was the the success of that was the, the real key to Cameron deciding. And also the success of Terminator 2 in 1991 was the, the impetus for Cameron to go back and finish The Abyss. Now, I've tried to find, you know, some interview with Cameron where he talks about which version of The Abyss he prefers. I'm not entirely sure, um, and I might have just missed it, so if anyone could, like, fill me in on that, I'd love to know. But either way, it was, and it is, remains the most substantial extended cut of one of his films. And he's done this a fair bit over the years. He's done Aliens, then he did The Abyss, Terminator 2 has multiple versions, Avatar has multiple versions, Titanic he left alone, True Lies he left alone, and The Terminator he left alone untouched. But uh, The Abyss is by far the most substantial with 29 minutes of new material, um, which comprises 41 cuts um, that are different to the theatrical cut, whereas Aliens, the special edition, was 17 minutes longer than the theatrical. Terminator 2 was around 15 minutes longer, and likewise with Avatar. Um, if you look at the, the longest version of Avatar, which is the third version, the extended special edition version i think the, the the collector's extended edition something some bullshit like that that's around 16 minutes so the abyss is like almost double in length longer as a special edition version of one of his films than anything else that he's done and honestly it didn't feel like it um and it's strange because you know aliens has the big Hadley's Hope sequence where you see the colony on the planet before the aliens um, fuck everything up and you have the scene with Ripley finding out about her daughter, a huge subplot um, brought into the film and then with Terminator 2 you have the Michael Bean cameo with Carl Reese, the dream sequence and you have the, the very substantial scene story-wise for me where the chip is removed from the Terminator's head, Arnold's T-800 character and Sarah Connor and John Connor debating about whether or not to destroy this chip and it's a, a very important moment in, in the story that was removed from the theatrical version. Avatar um, is one of those films that I, I love so much and I only watch the, the longest version because I want to get as much of that world as possible. So for me, that kind of all blends in. I don't really, because as soon as the extended cut of Avatar came out, which was very, it was like a, a year after the theatrical um, release. In fact, I think Avatar came out December 2009, the extended version came out in cinemas the following summer, and then by the, the following winter there was the extended special edition version, or whatever you want to call it, so I've only, since it came out in Blu-ray, just watched the extended version, but uh, I would say there are some scenes in the extended, the longest version of Avatar that I think are integral to the film and are really important story beats, such as Grace Augustine talking about the, the school and what happened when she was teaching Natiri, and, and that backstory I think is really important to the film. So, you know, for me, all of his extended versions have something in them. Whether or not I prefer them overall, they have very important scenes in them. With The Abyss, I, I don't think there is anything that is absolutely vital. I do think there are scenes that are very good and should be in the film. 
And so I've watched it now. I've watched the special edition and there's just so much to talk about. I haven't even begun to get into this. Um, but The Abyss, the special edition version, Cameron, once the film had come out in 1989, he went in with his editor and basically put all that footage back in and made kind of a cut for his own kind of personal, I guess, you know, archive of, of a lengthier version of The Abyss, all that stuff that was cut out originally, because it was one of those things where the studio wanted it to be, you know, around a certain length, you know, because they didn't want to show a three-hour movie in cinemas because they couldn't show it as many times and make as much money. 1990, Dances with Wolves came out and was a very long film and just played like gangbusters, and so I think that was one of those things where you thought, well, you know, maybe a longer version of this film can work and there'll be an audience for it. And so this special edition version was commissioned once Cameron and his company Lightstorm Entertainment made the multi-picture deal with 20th Century Fox, which was worth um, many, many millions of dollars. He allocated some of that money to completing The Abyss and doing some of the special effects shots that weren't completed when they were originally making the film and the, the big deleted sequence that comes at the end of the Abyss Special Edition. So with all of that visual effects stuff, you know, completed and ILM were brought back in to finish the work that they'd started, I think that it was really a case of them, uh, the, the, the kind of technology was not up to scratch for the big tidal wave sequence, which we'll get to later on in the video. So I think that was partially the reason that Cameron decided to scrap the whole tidal wave kind of finale of the film. And um, I'm sure that people have varying opinions out there on whether that, that tidal wave sequence should be in the film or shouldn't be in the film. So, you know, all that was squared away. And in 1992, the special edition cut of The Abyss was completed. In 1993, it was released on Laserdisc and also given a brief um, theatrical re-release. And I honestly have no clue, no idea, no perception whatsoever of what people think of The Abyss in relation to its theatrical cut and its special edition extended cut. I have no concept of it. And I think, again, partially that is because the film was never released on Blu-ray, and so the the kind of the conversation amongst collectors like myself who collect all these high-definition films on Blu-ray, that discussion isn't there because we're not talking about it because it hasn't been released. And so I feel like the abyss has been left behind in, in, kind, of, in kind of a dark, empty abyss of, you know, uh, of no discussion. You know, peop when people talk about The Abyss, they just talk about the fact, you know, why can't we get it? Why isn't it streaming? And, and it's it's kind of popped up here and there on streaming services over the years. I since have found out that the version I watched from the theatrical cut was sourced from either HBO or Cinemax. Uh, it was released there in 2014. It surfaced on uh, UK Netflix in 2017. And I think both versions of the film have been shown on streaming services in high definition over the past 10 years or so in, in very brief kind of just spotty it'll pop up here and there for some reason i don't know the full story and another thing i really don't know the full story about which is why i almost debated about whether or not i should bring it up but i think it is something that i should note i just really don't i haven't done the research on it and i try to but it is an absolute minefield and i feel like i'd need to get a book that says aspect ratios for dummies and really do my homework because I don't really know too much about aspect ratios. I know kind of just instinctively what I like to see in an aspect ratio. I appreciate different aspect ratios. I think there there, there are pluses and minuses to, to all of them. And, um, you know, I like old films in the fuller frame ratio. I like films in the super wide cinema scope kind of ratio, but I, I don't really have a certain preference. But um, there are certain advantages um, to all of them, I think, and certain disadvantages to all of them, too, depending on the kind of story that you're trying to tell. And more and more um, filmmakers are toying around with different aspect ratios. And uh, there's a whole, you can just make a whole video and even a whole series about the history of aspect ratios. But I don't know much about The Abyss other than um, Cameron wanted, I think he wanted to film Aliens in Super 35, but couldn't. And so he was ultimately a little bit... Um, disappointed in retrospect with the aspect ratio that he filmed Aliens in, which I don't remember off the top of my head, but he said that uh, in the commentary of Aliens, he said that from every film after Aliens, which at that point would only be Terminator 2, no, uh, The Abyss, Terminator 2, True Lies, and Titanic, he shot in Super 35, which from what I understand is essentially taking the 35mm strip and then just, you know, 
filling up the whole thing basically but i'm not sure because again there's there's just so many different variables in terms of like how you present that in home video and then that becomes a part of the film story um not so much in terms of the theatrical run and, and how it looked there and you get all these people saying it wasn't how i saw it in the cinemas 30 years ago that i remember so clearly <laughs> but you know uh i think that uh, the abyss was shot you know in super 35 and had varying aspect ratios on, on DVD, on VHS, on Laserdisc. I have absolutely no clue at all what Cameron prefers, what is intended. You know, um, as far as I'm aware, it was shot Super 35 and then cropped into a widescreen um, ratio for cinemas. Um, again, I don't know the exact aspect ratio, but a wider screen look, not the full frame kind of thing. And there's pan and scan, and Cameron has talked about that. And uh, I, I should have, there's a great quote from Cameron about pan and scan that I really should have remembered or researched, and uh, maybe I'll throw that into a, a future video if I can remember to, <laughs> to look it up. But um, the extended, the special edition version of the film that I watched literally just like an hour ago, because this is really, I'm really cutting this down to the wire. This is the last, last thing I'm doing for this entire series. I was really putting it off, and I think it's just because I had to watch the film again and again. This is now the third time I've watched The Abyss in the past six months, and I think that it was partially because I really wanted to love the film. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. This is going to be a really long video, I think. So the aspect ratio of the special edition version that I found online, because again, if you haven't seen my, my video on the abyss, um, I illegally downloaded it and I have no shame in saying that because what the hell else am I going to do? It isn't available on streaming. We can't buy it. It's been 10 plus years, no Blu-ray. I'll buy it day one and whatever kind of fancy daylight robbery special edition 50 pound version they want to release it in. But until that day, I'm going to find a way to watch it in the best possible quality. So the special edition version I watched was um, nowhere near as um, accomplished visually as the theatrical version that I saw. And I, I know that the, the theatrical cut that I watched um, sourced from a high definition um, streaming uh, source, I believe looked fantastic there's, there's a good grain structure to it obviously compressed because of the ripping it from streaming and everything but the person who had uploaded that had regraded it and it looked fantastic this one didn't look anywhere near as good in terms of contrast and color and also it didn't have that kind of grain structure to it it still looks fine it was watchable on a 65 inch tv and it's in high definition it's not you know it's not standard def so that was a plus and i enjoyed it for that but um, the big thing for me was that it was open matte and I was looking into this about the film and I was trying to like Google what, what aspect ratio was the abyss supposed to be in, what's the original intention, I couldn't find the answers. And then I'm going down a rabbit hole of people saying, there's no such thing as open mat, that isn't a professional term, I don't know. But essentially the version I saw uh, filled the whole screen. So the theatrical cut, you've got the black bars on the top and the bottom, it's a widescreen image. The version for the special edition that I have and have sourced uh, to watch for this series um, is full. It fills the whole screen. I don't think that's even the full Super 35 image, but regardless, it shows you more information on the top and the bottom. So I actually put two, the two of them side by side just to see you know, how much you're missing in, in the widescreen version. And obviously it's been composed with the widescreen in mind, I think, because there really isn't anything that dramatically is like, wow, it looks so much better. But you know, there are certain sequences and certain scenes and shots where having that information on the top and the bottom, um, it fills out the experience a little bit more. So it was really cool. So whenever this fucking thing does get a Blu-ray release, I'd be really intrigued. I mean, I'm the kind of guy who would like to see this Blu-ray, this even if it was 4K, I'd like to see like three discs, like both versions of the film, both versions of every aspect ratio. Like I'd love that option. There's a film I have in the um, MOC collection, the Masters of Cinema, um, Touch of Evil, the Orson Welles film from the 50s, I think. And that, that Blu-ray release has, I think, five different versions of the film and three different aspect ratios. So I love that. I love being able to choose. And I would love to see, honestly, the, I think I would like to see this film going forward in that aspect ratio because I like I like it filling the whole screen. I'm not like a, a kind of, um, I'm not pedantic about it like some people. Like, oh, I don't like these black bars on the top or on the sides. Like, I really don't care. Once you're into the film, that stuff doesn't matter, and it just melts away. You know, the the black bars on the top and the bottom, they don't distract me any in, in the same way that sitting in my room doesn't distract me from watching a film. If I'm into it, I'm not looking at the walls or the lights or anything like that, you know, or anything around the TV or the stand or the PlayStation 4 or the Blu-ray player. That stuff doesn't matter the same way that the black bars on the top and the bottom don't matter when you're engaged in the film. 
And there's been some talk about aspect ratios because Zack Snyder's new Justice League is coming out and it's in a more square ratio, not widescreen, and people are kind of losing their minds over it. Anyway, so the version I saw was from what I would describe open mat, but regardless, it is a different aspect ratio to the theatrical version I saw, which didn't dramatically um, improve the experience. But again, there's a few shots where, especially when Bud... Ed Harris's character is, is walking out to begin that descent into the abyss, so to speak. And it's that slow walk and the music, the ominous music, and you just just seeing everything on the top and the bottom, I think it just um, it enhances that moment, especially when you see him walking to the edge of the kind of trench and you see the deep core set around him. And you can see that's a person. You can see this isn't a miniature. It's a really breathtaking shot when you see the extent of the, the full deep core set that they built in that tank um, when they filmed it. And uh, it's just uh, one of the best visual shots of the whole film. And that is helped, I think, by seeing more information on the top and the bottom, just me. Anyway, the film itself, um, the special edition changes. <sighs> I mean, there are certain scenes I think are really good, but there's nothing that blew me away or not even necessarily blew me away because it's not what you should really be looking for, but there's nothing that I thought, wow, I can't believe they cut that out, you know. And there's a few, I don't know, there's, there's beats here and there that I think just, you know, maybe not so much. You know, there's a couple of things, um, and I'm trying to think of how to even best approach this. Like I said, 41 cuts, 29 minutes worth of new material. Actually, before I get to that, before I get to the special edition stuff, let me just give you my kind of thoughts on how it changed my viewing of The Abyss. I think I enjoyed The Abyss this time around a little bit more than the previous two times. I re revisited it for this series but not because it was the special edition version, just because I'm watching it again and again, and I'm becoming more familiar with the film, and some of the finer details, which I do think aren't necessarily clear when you watch it. I don't know, and it might just be that my mind was slipping during key moments, but um, the sequence when the crane that is kind of attached to the deep core, from the explorer ship on the surface of the ocean to the deep core station down on the seabed, um, they're connected by an umbilical, which I guess is um, how they move the deep core um, station around the ocean bed and at some point there's a storm and because they're still attached and they haven't been able to detach in time the crane gets like destroyed and pulled in and I honestly had no idea why that really happened I, I, I guess I just wasn't paying attention the first two times but this time around you know they're saying if we don't get out that umbilical detached then we're not gonna I was like oh right okay that makes more sense you know, and that isn't a special edition change in addition. That's just, it's just one of those things sometimes where I think that, um, but I, 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 I will see, I do think some details of the story and the characters and, um, well, maybe not the story and the characters, but the, the, the kind of technical details of things that are going on in the story could have been laid out a little bit more clearly, even though I do appreciate when a filmmaker doesn't do the hand holding and the lathering on of exposition that they like to do, which is understandable, but at the same time, I enjoy it when I have to figure it out for myself a little bit. And so now that I've seen the film a few times, I don't think it's an issue. But um, for me, certainly the first time I watched it or rewatched it last year, it was like, oh, what's that? Why is that crane an issue? Like, I wasn't entirely sure. Um, and Connie, who had watched the film with me six months ago, she didn't rewatch it the past two times I've rewatched it. And she was sat next to me earlier tonight and she was already, already calling stuff that was about to happen. Um, so clearly her memory on certain details in films can be a lot better than, and sharper than mine can, because I certainly wouldn't have remembered what was going to happen next six months after the fact. Anyway, that's a whole other aside. But overall, I think I enjoyed the film more, but it didn't give me that extra oomph that I was hoping it would. It didn't bump it from a 4.5 out of 5 to a 5. And I do, admittedly, hand on heart, you know, I completely own up to it. I, I do fall into that trap of wanting a film to be like a full marks kind of film because it's from someone who I really love. It's like, oh, he's, he's one of my favorite directors and I can point to at least four of his movies and say they're five star, five star, five star, five star. And I kind of want The Abyss to be a five-star movie for me, but it just isn't. And I'm going to have to try and let go of that. And again, like I said in my, my main review of the film, maybe that'll change in years to come. That's entirely possible. Uh, and, and certainly I'm enjoying it more now that I'm watching it again and again. But having to watch it two more times in, in such short proximity is not how I usually like to watch films, especially films like this that are fairly lengthy and uh, a lot of the time slow pace, but I think I've isolated my main issue with the film. Well, I have two main issues with the film. One is the ending, but I already knew that was an issue for me. But the one thing that was getting me hung up on the film, I didn't know what it was that 
because there's so much of it I love. There's some great acting. The the technical aspects and the visual aspects are just absolutely breathtaking. Just such an achievement visually and you know, technically, again, just how they managed to mount that production. It, it was with great difficulty and with a lot of stress and trauma, but, you know, um, it all comes through on the, the, the big screen on, you know, in the end of the day and the final product. But the one thing that I just, what is it about the film that I'm not fully connecting with that's kind of throwing me off? And it's the first act. So the film starts, we have the American submarine with all the nukes on it. It encounters the NTI. They accidentally crash into the side of a trench in the ocean. That's fine. Then we cut to, you know, the deep core and the the, uh, the Bethnic uh, Explorer. Benthic? Bethnic? The Benthic Explorer. Um, the ship on the surface. And we kind of see those two kind of uh, in, in correlation with each other and saying, okay, there's been an accident with a submarine. We're sending you guys down to investigate. We're bringing the Navy SEALs down. That's all fine. You know, we've got Ed Harris's character, um, you know, Bud, and he's just like, you know, doesn't want to work with these Navy SEALs, doesn't want to send his crew down there to do something that's not their job. They're going to get paid three times as much, and so his crew is all for it. And then they go down to investigate the submarine. This is all fine, but once they go to the submarine, about half an hour into the film, that's where I struggle. And I don't know why, because it's a good scene. It's a really good scene, but it's just, it's very slow paced. Um, and and I, I said in my review that the film is very... I don't think the film is that slow-paced. I just think it's that sequence. And it's a fairly chunky sequence. And they're, they're methodically working through the submarine. And in the special edition version, it's even lengthier because they really expand that whole sequence. And, and I really love a lot of it. Like, seeing all the... You know, the idea of this submarine that crashed and was... You know, all the water came in and there's bodies and stuff. And there's so many impressive visual moments in that. Uh, in subtle ways, I think, that you just think, wow, they, you're just the dead bodies alone and seeing the actual people there playing the dead bodies and, and being completely convincing is a very impressive thing to put together in front of a camera, I think, with the lighting and the people. There's just so much at play there and it's very risky stuff. But And maybe they use dummies, I don't know. If they did, they did an amazing job. But regardless, there's just things about the submarine sequence that look great. And, you know, it's a good scene, but I always kind of, almost switch off during it and I, I my mind starts to drift and I almost get a bit sleepy you know I was watching it tonight and I've had plenty of sleep I don't feel tired at all but once that scene hits it's like you know I'm, I'm just trying to like wake myself up a little bit I don't know what it is it's just again it might just be the time that I'm watching it and just the mood and everything but that sequence to me just seems to be a little bit too slow maybe I don't but then I don't want it to move quicker because then I, I you're rushing things so it's just tricky and that's why I'm not a filmmaker you know but I think my issue with the film is that first act in terms of it takes a while to get the gears churning. But even, again, it's a complete, you know, it's a complete dichotomy because I don't I don't like it when, when films rush through those plots either. And I think that um, giving time to those things is really valuable and key to having a, a story that pays off in a movie is giving everything its due time. So it's tricky. I don't know. It's just tricky. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But it's it. I've definitely isolated that I struggle with that sequence, the submarine kind of um, salvage sequence, if you will. Once they get back and things start to kind of get going again, I think that's when I really get into the film. And that lasts like, you know, two hours in the special edition version. I'm really into it and I'm just loving it. You know, I, I think it's the, it's when the crane accident happens and everything kicks off on the deep core. It, the, the film kicks into a, a different kind of gear and never really lets up. Even in the moments where it slows down, it's all great character stuff, you know? And I, again, I, I sung the praises of the moment when Jammer is um, the guy who kind of panics inside the submarine and he's kind of, you just hear his point of view and hear the breathing and he's pulling the rope and it's all frayed and he's alone and it's dark and then the blue lights come up. Incredible moment, but, you know, overall the submarine sequence just seems to, and I don't know why, but again, maybe in, in repeat viewings, things will change for me on that. Now, the special edition, um, I guess I have to talk about the ending when we get to the ending. So the special edition changes and additions to the film. They're, they're spread out throughout the whole thing. And it's just all just new character stuff, really. There's, there's Apart from the ending, there's nothing hugely significant in terms of like a big scene or a big subplot introduced. We get more of Bud and Lindsay, which I really appreciate because they're the two best characters in the film. And we get to see a sequence where they kind of... They're at each other's throats and they're talking about the fact that she has a new lover who she's now not not with anymore. And so I think maybe that was a wise decision to cut that because 
um, it kind of almost muddles muddies the water a little bit where it's like, oh, she's actually with someone else, but not really, not anymore. I don't know, maybe it kind of, well, maybe not. I mean, I watch it and I, I completely read it and it's fine. But um, I can understand maybe why it's not the most vital scene to keep. But I enjoy just having more of them kind of bouncing off each other in, in, in kind of a negative way. But you can tell, I mean, it's a really well done relationship, I think, because you feel you feel how they've been drawn together and you also feel why they've been driven apart. And I couldn't help but again think about James Cameron and his relationship with um, his his wife at the time, who he was divorcing, Gail Hurt, who he'd worked with on Terminator and Aliens. Because there's a sequence where he's talking to one knight about um, his relationship with Lindsay. It starts a bit clunkily where it's almost like, it almost feels like one knight is like, well, let's do that scene. You know, I can't remember how it starts, but it starts in a way that feel, felt very unnatural in a way to start talking about Lindsay. But he begins talking about it and, and he, he again, we get more backstory on how Bud and Lindsay work together on some ship or something and uh, you know, similar work. And, uh, and by the time they, they, they kind of came off on shore, they became married very quickly. And uh, they're talking about this, and Bud says that, well, you know, we're going to go back on this ship, and if we're married, we get a stateroom, but if we're not, then it'll be bunks, separate bunks. And uh, one night's like, wow, so that's a really good reason to get married then, I guess. And uh, and uh, there was just a certain amount of, you know, it felt like him and Lindsay had, had got together and had worked together and, and, and through a very intense kind of you know, it's an intense kind of thing when you're working on a boat on a ship and you're kind of isolated and you can't really escape each other. And I feel like that's probably what making a movie is like. And that's what he'd done with Gail Hurd with the, with Terminator and with Aliens. And so I, I just couldn't help but, to, again, draw these comparisons, which maybe I shouldn't do, but it was very much in the back of my head as I was watching that sequence. But you get more of their backstory and more of, of the relationship between Bud and Coffee. Not that there's much of a relationship there, but the the interplay between them and the tension between them. You know, you get him coming up and, and kind of talking to Coffee and apologizing for the gruff nature of his crew. He replies very gruffly to him and, you know, they think he's a bit of a dick and everything, but there's a really great scene, which I would say should have absolutely stayed in the final cut, in which Coffee is, is trying to, like, take things over. And he says to one night, you know, um, have you done this certain thing yet? And she's like, no, I was doing my nails, you know, just like, she's basically just saying, fuck you, I'm not taking all the orders from you, you're not my boss. And he gets really, you know, look, you're under my authority here. And so it gets really tense and like Catfish comes in and he's just like, you know, you're not the boss of us, we're not going to do what you say. And Bud steps in, he's like, hey, you want to just go go over there, check the sonar, you know, and, and he completely kind of dissolves the kind of tension and Bud steps in and tries to kind of reach a level with coffee, reach a compromise. And that's a really great sequence because it shows you that um, coffee isn't this like, you know, he's, he's clearly a little bit amped up. And as we saw from, you know, as soon as he gets down to the deep core, his hand starts to shake just a little bit. And I noticed this time, I didn't notice the first time around when he first gets on the, um, the video call with his boss up on the, the surface, um, his eyes twitch just ever so slightly. There's a little bit of a, an eye tweak. And it's a really subtle thing Michael Bean did that's fucking brilliant and just it just sows all the seeds that begin to, you know, sprout and explode towards the end of the film or towards the end of his, you know, final moments of the film. So that sequence I think was really good because it 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 just it didn't feel like Coffee was the enemy so much. And it felt like Bud was not just like, oh, this guy's a dick and he's not the boss of our place and we're not gonna do anything. Like he's like Bud is actively trying to help things out. And he says to one night, can you go, can you, could you go and do this for me? And she kind of begrudgingly agrees and kind of almost shoves past coffee. So it's this kind of, you know, he's trying to, to, to make things better for everyone. And, you know, coffee, you can tell, you know, he's not trying to be a dick. He's just trying to do what he thinks is the right thing. And that just makes his character more sympathetic um, as you begin to see him just completely just dissolve as, as the film goes on. Uh, not that I think he's an entirely sympathetic character, but I do think there's 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 more to Coffee than just the bad guy or the guy who goes crazy. Like I don't know, I just think that uh, even the even the part which isn't a new addition, but it's when he went down with his crew, you know, without the permission of Bud to take all the 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 flatbed down to retrieve the warhead. And you know they're all pissed off about it. The big accident happens, and then Coffee says to Bud, like, look, I'm sorry. I don't know if he says I'm sorry, but he says. Um, it wasn't my decision. It, I was, it was, I was, what do you say? I was working on orders. Like it was, I, no, I was following orders. It wasn't my decision, you know? So even then coffee is trying to, 
you know, reach out the olive branch to, to Bud and say, look, I'm not just, you know, being a dick here. Like, I just had to follow orders. I'm sorry. Again, I don't know if he actually says I'm sorry and apologizes. But, you know, I like that there's, and, and in the special edition, you get a little bit more of that. And there's a really great shot in the special edition when tension gets really high with, with Coffee and the rest of the crew. And they all leave, and he's left alone or with another one of his uh, seals. And uh, it's a brilliant, like, real shot. Like, there's no miniatures or anything where he just kind of leans against the, um, the wall. And it's the camera shot is outside the window, the porthole. And you can see he's just so stressed out and he's just like, like, what's going on? Like, what, what is happening to me? How am I going to get out of this? Like, have I taken things too far? All this stuff is coming out of his performance as he just kind of rests against the kind of, you know, looking out of the window and the camera just pans out and then like slowly tilts down. You see the deep core and like down into the, you know, the, the kind of the ledge of the, you know, the trench and the abyss. And it's just a really great shot. I mean, it's a lengthy shot, but it, it shows off the set, but it also shows you his isolation as the camera just pulls back. It's just a brilliant visual moment that I think um, really should have stayed in the film. And so there's there's lots of different things, little little tweaks here and there. There's a lot of more stuff about the radiation from the nuclear warheads on the submarine, like that. There's loads of little additions in there where like um, Hippie is like really concerned about the radiation from the warheads, and they they do a meter reading of it when they get to the submarine. So there's lots of little things like that. And from what I'd heard, they lean more in the special edition into the kind of um, the Soviet kind of like Cold War kind of. Um, storyline in which there are Russians out there in submarines, there's an American submarine with warheads, nukes, and, you know, the tensions between those two countries, those two entities, and um, it didn't actually feel that way to me. I mean, there are, there are certain bits, you know, where Lindsay is um, hovering over the submarine, and she's asking just how much firepower is behind these nukes, and how many are on board this submarine, and she's like, wow, it's like World War Three in a can. So that's a new line that was added for the special edition. And there are a lot more um, broadcasts from the news on television and like the, the nuclear fear and are the Russians going to attack and all of this sort of stuff. Are the Americans getting ready with all of their nukes and all this stuff becomes public and it starts to really, you know, create this kind of public panic. And they show that through TV broadcasts, which are received down on the deep core. So there's a few bits of that in the special edition, but I didn't think that it leaned into it hugely um, compared to the theatrical version, it just accentuates it a little bit. So I was actually expecting more from that, not in the way that it disappointed me, but I thought that it would be like a almost an overbearing, you know, kind of um, subplot or an overbearing kind of element to the story that would override things and feel a little bit too extreme. But it was it, it worked with the, the story that was laid out with those that nuclear warhead that gets brought on board the deep core and what causes a lot of the problems. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention um, in my original review of the film is the score by Alan Silvestri. I love the score, um, especially towards the end. Towards the end with the the alien city or ship, I still don't know what that fucking thing is. Uh, oh, the music is soaring and beautiful when they reach when Bud reaches that that location. It's just such a it's like a big payoff, both visually and with the music. And I, I love the marrying of those two things in, in certain moments. But there are many like uh, exciting action scenes in the film. Um, I think like when the deep core, the water's rushing in and everything. And also when Coffee, Lindsay and Bud are having the two, the collisions with the two, the, the submersibles um, towards the end of the film. The kind of, the action-y kind of cues from Alan Silvestri feel so much like the Predator. They really feel like his score for Predator. Like there's just not like that he uses the same cues, but the kind of instruments and the kind of tempo and the kind of the sound of it, you know, it just feels very much like um, Predator and kind of some of those scenes. So that was one of the things that it really reminded me of. But it's overall, I think, a very good score. I didn't know what to call the water tentacle thing. It's apparently called a pseudopod, which I did know, but I don't know what that entirely means anyway. Um, so yeah, anyway, right, where am I going with this? I, I've suddenly lost the plot. I think that coming to the end of this video now, and, and this is now one of the last videos I'm filming for this entire series, I feel like I'm just like about to fall apart from all this James Cameron stuff going on inside my head. And just to kind of date this video a little bit, Avatar just became the number one highest grossing film of all time again. Uh, just a couple of days ago, and I might do a separate video about that, but it's so funny to me, the irony is not lost on me at all, <laughs> that I've made a video, uh, I've made a series of videos, I should say, entitled Cameron King of the World, which is, yeah, it's kind of a jokey title, kind of tongue-in-cheek, and he became the quote-unquote king of the world again, 
um, during half, like smack dab in the middle of this series, you know, coming out live on my channel in March of 2021. Right, so the ending of the film. This is where the most significant change occurs in the special edition. It is a five minute scene that's added. So in the theatrical cut, Bud goes down to the big alien ship. We'll call it a ship for argument's sake. He goes down to the um, the ship and he takes off his helmet and the water comes out. The air comes back into his lungs and there's two walls of water on either side of him. On one wall, you see the aliens. And again, we'll just call them aliens for, for the sake of this art, for the sake of this video. On the other wall, we have projections. And uh, he asks, why did you save me? And they very simply show him the screen of what he typed into his suit saying, um, love you wife to, to Lindsay. And so they're basically saying that we recognize that you, you have kindness and love in your heart. So we saved your life and that's it. And then they bring him up to bring him up to the surface. He reunites with Lindsay, the, the kind of the ship is now on the surface of the water and everyone sees it and we cut to credits. That's the end. And it felt very rushed to me. So I was kind of hoping, and I, I really can't remember if I've seen this before, the special edition version. Connie seems to think she has watched it before, so maybe we did 10 years ago, but I really can't remember it. Again, I feel like, like I said before, with the tidal waves, I feel like it was something that I probably would have really remembered from when I watched it earlier, but I just, you know, it didn't feel um, like I'd seen it before. I don't know. So I, I guess I'll never know because my memory is not that good to remember every single fucking thing I've seen throughout my entire life. And, and The Abyss isn't one of my favorite movies, so I don't obsess over it as much as I do other films. So in the special edition version, Bud goes down to the alien ship, um, takes off his helmet, water comes out, air comes back into his lungs, the aliens appear on one side, and on the other side, they start showing broadcasts of panic around the world because tsunamis have begun to basically circle, like I think every continent on the world. So these tidal waves have just appeared everywhere and then they just stop like a thousand feet in the air and just, just hold there like really menacingly and threateningly, just like, you know, this is, this is, we're about to destroy humanity here. And, and Bud is like, why are you doing this? And they begin to show him images of TV clips and film clips of nuclear bombs exploding. And, uh, and then they just start showing it really rapidly. Like the editing gets really like manic and he's like, okay, I get it. I get the point, <laughs> you know? which is kind of what I was thinking. Like, okay, you're laying it on a bit thick and Bud's like, okay, I get the point. I get the point. And he's just like, but, but why, why do this to us? How do you know? And, and that was probably the only part of that I really liked when he's like, how do you know? You know, because there is this, this, this knee jerk feeling, I think from people to just condemn others on mistakes that they've made. And obviously in this case, it's framed through the, the, the big idea of the mistakes that humanity have made along the way and how we have destroyed each other. And that's a very big thing. It really is. But I think just on the basic human level, I think that we, especially now in the age of social media, we're very quick to condemn people on their mistakes. And it's like an absolute, you know, and not to the point where we're going to kill them with a tidal wave, but to the point where we cut them out of our lives and we say, those people are cancelled and they're done. Now, that's a whole other topic. Don't get me wrong. And there are some people who get quote unquote cancelled that I think should. Uh, in a lot of cases, that's career stuff and that's famous people. But I think just there are certain things where I think we're too judgmental. Sometimes we should be. But I also think sometimes we shouldn't. So when he said to them, but how do you know? And it's like, well, how do you know this person is going to keep making the same mistakes? How do you know that they're not going to learn? How do you know that they can't be given a second chance and, you know, and act on it and deliver upon it? You don't know. So it's, it's, it's all well and good to say that, you know, person number A has done something bad. So we are going to punish them. And that is that. And there's no coming back from it ever. Um, but it's not quite as simple as that, you know? So I liked that bit, just that simple bit where Bud says, but how do you know? Right. And then they show more footage of famine and kind of, you know, atrocities of mankind. And I think there's some Hitler footage in there, or at least like Nazis. And, you know, it shows you a lot of other horrible things. And I don't know if that quite worked, just showing more of that stuff. Obviously, the nuclear bombs going off shows you the, the horrors of, and destruction that humanity has created. And then, you know, how people have suffered from that. And I've suffered from, you know, stuff, you know, that's outside of nuclear you know, bombs and weaponry. It's just the, just the pure hatred and all that stuff that has been fostered through evil people. And then they, um, the waves disperse and they go down and they, they spare humanity. And he's like, oh, why did you do that? <laughs> and this is where the scene gets a bit clunky for me. It's just him looking at screen saying, you know, why this, you know, why that? Well, well, well how do you know? Okay. 
Why did you do that? You know, it, it didn't, it, it doesn't flow very well for me in terms of the way that it's been written and presented, even though I think it's a bit too simple. I think it's a bit too, um, almost elementary, I think, you know, which people may really disagree with me on that, but I think that it's, uh, yeah, it's a bit too on the nose and Cameron has been on the nose, but I think that, that sometimes he gets away with it. A lot of the times he gets away with it. This time for me, he doesn't quite get away with it. And, and then they, then they show his, mes his messages to Lindsay and, you know, um, that he knew he was going down there to to risk his life or to, to sacrifice his life. I'm not sure in the theatrical version if they show the message where he says, "I knew this was a one way ticket," but um, they you know they basically say to him by showing him the message that we saw that you were doing something selfless, that you sacrificed your life knowingly to save others, and that you have a love for someone else, and that's given us you know cause to you know rethink our. <laughs> very, you know, measured decision to, to kill the entire planet. I don't know. So I, I think it just, it's a bit too, it comes out of nowhere. You know, I, I prefer the theatrical cut where even though it's rushed, you're not bringing in this whole subplot of the aliens are going to try and kill the whole world <laughs> for what they've done. And then, you know, when Bud comes back on the, the kind of the keypad and he's messaging the, the crew on the deep core and they relay what he's saying up to the surface with the, um, the Benthic Explorer. She's, you know, Lindsay saying, oh, you know, Bud Brigman back on the air and all of this stuff. And it's, it's, it's very brief, I think, you know, and like, oh, I've made some new friends down here. You're going to love this. And that's when the, the ship comes up. But in the special edition version, he explains that um, I've made some new friends down here. They're not happy with the way that things are going on the surface. And they think that, um, you know, you need to step up, you know, humans need to, to change things and all this. And it just... It's very, it's, I don't know, heavy handed, you know, I don't think it works entirely for me. And it just, again, the original ending kind of comes out of nowhere. We well, didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, they build, build up the NTIs, the non-terrestrial intelligence creatures perfectly, actually. Very, I mean, from the very opening scene of the film to the finale, that's actually beautifully built. What comes out of nowhere is kind of where the end, where the film ends. Because you end with them on the surface with this ship and, you know, Bud and Lindsay reunite, but then just it just ends. So where does the ship go then? Do the aliens come out? Is there any further communications? Does the ship fly off into space? Does it go back down to the bottom of the ocean? Are they going to stay there kind of with a watchful eye on humanity? We know what's going on. In the special edition version, we find that they've been judging humanity and have been learning what they've been doing. But also... What I wanted to mention in my initial review, but I was saving until this video was, I don't know um, if these are meant to be aliens from another planet, from elsewhere in the galaxy or the, the solar system or the universe, or whether they're just uh, an intelligent um, form of life that have lived on the bottom of the ocean for as long as the Earth has been around. And they do, there's a, a new scene in the special edition where they discuss this on the deep core. And Lindsay says, I think they're up from up there, you know, and that's the only time that it's mentioned, but I at least liked that they referenced it in the special edition version, because I feel like that's something that was missing, was just like, well, what are these things? And then they talk about what are these things, but they they never explicitly say. I think Catfish says in the theatrical version as well that, um, you know, what are you saying, these are spacemen or something like that, but no one outright says, well, where do you think they're from? So I liked that new little beat in in the kind of, in the film but it isn't explained and I, I i get the the appeal of not explaining it because it's it's not as much work and also the film was so long up until that point but i feel like there must have been a better way to end the film which doesn't necessarily give you answers but gives you more of a conclusion i don't know because i just wonder well, what happens next like you know does the ship go down does it go up does it stay there what happens next you know and, and i don't feel like it's a film that needs a sequel but um, it, it didn't leave me wanting more in a good way. It left me, it leaves me wanting more, continues to leave me wanting more in a kind of a, an itch that you can't scratch kind of way. You know, I think that, um, something about it just doesn't sit completely right with me, even though I love the grandeur of the ending and I have no problem with it being this very fantasy, like science fiction, like finale. I think that it's, um, really cool. You know, just, just, I, I love that kind of stuff. I also love when the music, when the pseudopod arrives and Lindsay's looking at it and it's kind of recreating her face and the music becomes so childlike and fa like a like a, a family film fantasy movie and it and it completely contrasts with the entire movie up to the way that the score sounds but I love it because it just leans into the wonder of the pseudopod sequence and that was just something that I, I quite enjoyed about the score and how it worked and I do I do I mean it's one of those things where the film is you know I mean 
there's almost a version of this film where you take out the NTIs, you take out the the aliens or the life forms, whatever you want to call them, and it's still a really fucking great film about this this submarine and these nuclear warheads. You know, I think that uh, there, I think you could almost make an edit of the film where you remove that that whole stuff. Um, but at the same time, I think it's 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 such a huge part of the story too, and it's just it's trickled in so brilliantly throughout. You know, I love those scenes when Lindsay's first seeing them, and uh, there's just there's so much I love about the film. There, there really is. The special edition introduced some good character moments that I really liked, but it didn't feel like it was a substantial addition to the film. Um, whereas there are bigger sequences that mean more to the story in his other extended cuts, in my opinion. The only thing that feels new and out of place, not out of place, but feels new and substantial is the, the new ending with the whole tidal wave sequence. And uh, yeah, it looks good. And I love tidal waves as kind of a one of those things that kind of scares me and intrigues me at the same time, brings me back to being a kid and being fascinated with anything that was larger than life. Like, what's the tallest building? What's the biggest mountain in the world? What's the biggest mountain in the solar system? I loved all that epic scale stuff. So a huge tidal wave just appeals to my sensibilities of really enjoying the wonder of large scale, almost impossible um, occurrences in nature. And, uh, you know, it's just always fascinated me and scared me at the same time, which is why it was so exciting and kind of nerve-wracking to go to the top of the Empire State Building for the first time. Um, probably the only time I would say it's, uh, you know, you, you get kind of the shaky knees. I remember going to the Eiffel Tower and just being like, it kind of excited me so much, but really I was so nervous being on that Eiffel Tower. I was a kid at the time. I probably handle it better now, but we went like almost halfway up onto the second level and just looking up just oh, it made me dizzy, you know. But I enjoyed it at the same time. So it's one of those things. So the tidal wave stuff, I love it visually, but I don't think the whole, the very rushed, like, um, oh, we're going to kill humanity now. No, maybe not. All right, okay, see ya. Like, it just, it's so, it just feels so almost slapped on, even though there must have been so much that went into the design of that whole sequence and everything. So it's just, yeah, it's tricky for me. I just have to live with the fact that I don't fully love The Abyss because the ending doesn't work as well as I think it should. And I think the whole film is so good up until that point. If the submarine sequence at the beginning in the first act was a little bit tighter, more effective maybe, and didn't make my mind drift as much. And if the ending, maybe, again, maybe if the ending had more time, which, you know, I, I didn't certainly didn't watch the special edition version, which is two hours and 40 minutes without credits, two hours 50 with credits. I didn't feel like it was too long. Um, you know, either way, I think that that submarine sequence just drags a bit for me and, and makes my mind wander and my eyes droop a little bit. So, I don't know. I, I think that it's, um, it, it could have done with just a meteor ending. I, I, I don't know. It's tricky because I think it was definitely the right move to not have the NTIs speak or communicate in a, in a way that was, you know, like, if they typed back on the machine or whatever, I wouldn't have liked that. I liked that it's this non-verbal communication. But I also liked, I think, the theatrical works better, even though it's rushed. They just show the simple message, love you, wife. And he looks at them, and he just kind of goes like that with a smile, like, I get it. You know, you, you saw that I was a good person, and you, you decided to save me, and I appreciate that. And they just kind of, the, the, the NTI just tilts its head and kind of winks. What does it wink? But the eyes blink, and there's just kind of like a an approximation of returning the gesture, you know, just brilliant, it's so subtly, brilliantly done, and I, I prefer the simplicity of that than the whole big overblown, we're going to destroy the world, and okay, maybe not because you seem like a good guy, you <laughs> know, just, it doesn't seem to fly or hold much water to me, no pun intended, um, and I love the design of those NTIs, I mean, I, it's very, they're very sparingly used, and we see, like, the different versions of, like, the little, um, their version of an ROV, or, well, I guess that's the pseudopod, but their version of a submersible, a little weird kind of, I mean, she says that I, I touched the ship, and it wasn't, like, made out of steel, it was, like, you know, it was this, and you can see a hand almost going into it, it's just this otherworldly substance, and you think of jellyfish and things like that, but there's obviously, like, inner workings to the machinery of it and stuff, which is really fascinating, but the actual, um, the almost like, um, moths or like butterflies, but like also jellyfishes, and then they have the kind of alien head inside, in a way, almost like inside the body, and it, maybe it's all about the body, I don't know, but there's a real elegance to the creation, I think is absolutely beautiful, I love those creatures, I love how sparingly they're used, so that every time you see them, it's a kind of wonder, I think. Anyway. I think I'm about done. I can't believe how much I talked about this film. You know, I, I go back to five months ago when I started filming videos for this series. 
And you know, I was doing 20 to 30 minute videos around the area that I wanted. And then I did my Terminator 2 review and it was 50 minutes and I couldn't believe it. And I thought, oh my God, I've talked for so long. I do The Abyss and it's like way over an hour and I wasn't even, I feel like I didn't even get started on that. So go figure. And this one I thought would be another simple 20 minute one, but I guess I had a lot to say about the special edition. Um, I would almost like to go in and do my own cut of the film. I think there are some scenes that really should stay in. The scene with Coffee kind of trying to assert his authority and getting that pushed back by the crew and Bud stepping in and dissolving the tension. I think that's a scene that should be in the film. The shot of Coffee when he's kind of leaning against the window and the camera pans out, that should be in the film. Um, there's stuff with Lindsay and Bud. Um, as Bud's going down into the abyss, uh, there's new bits and new beats where um, he, he starts to, he can't hear her voices clearly again on the comms. So they start turning off all, anything else that's using, you know, energy on the deep core. And I like that. It, it gave more of a frantic energy to the thing. And I think that's a scene that, that could do with being a bit longer. And there's a, a like a minute of new material in which Lindsay tells a story about how, you know, from when they were together, which is a really sweet little scene. So more of her great acting, I think. So that should stay. There's a lot of things that I think should stay in the film, but there are a few things that maybe aren't vital, you know. But um, but the ending for me just doesn't it doesn't work as well as the the theatrical version. There's one new shot in the very end when the crew are out on this the surface of the the ship um, on the ocean. And uh, you just see like, a, it's like a matte painting. It's a beautiful matte painting of, it just expands the visual a little bit more because um, if you know the behind the scenes of the film and you see them get out of the deep core set, you know that they're just in this tank, you know? So that reverse shot showing the other side with like the ships and stuff that have been like beached effectively on the, on the big alien um, ship city thing. Um, it gives it more of a, a visual. It just fills out the geography of the scene a little bit better, I think, in the final. So that should stay. Um, but yeah, I mean, if they if they were to release this on Blu-ray with both cuts, I would be interested in going in and kind of maybe even trying to cut down the submarine sequence a little bit. And that's a whole other thing. And uh, and just to round this off, which isn't even about the abyss, but throughout doing this series and not reviewing Aliens, I've actually started to think about going back and watching Aliens and doing a review of it and adding, adding it into the series as kind of a special edition episode. But I've also thought about doing my own cuts of Aliens. I've never done this before, but a fan edit of a film is something I've been intrigued about, you know, the concept of doing. And I'm now currently working on my version of Aliens, which is a very minimal re-edit. There's just a few things I wanted to change just to see if it would work. So I might make a video about that in the future, but now that I'm doing that and I'm really loving the process of it, even though I don't think that, you know, I mean, this, you know, do you touch someone else's art, you know? And I think if it's for personal enjoyment, I think that there's, I think that anything is fair game in a way. When you, you obviously you can't make money off it or show it to anyone in that sense, especially with a fan edit of a movie. But there are certain fan edits I've heard of where I just think people are being so obnoxious with them and and just very silly and, and trying to reinvent the wheel. But just certain minor things I'm interested in, in kind of tinkering around with and with the abyss. I'd love to just take the, the original ending and the theatrical version, as much as I think that one is still rushed, um, but keep some of the, the really good special edition scenes that, for me, add more to, to to Lindsay and Bud's relationship, but also mainly, well, not mainly, I think mainly Lindsay and Bud's relationship is is the, the best thing that, that, that benefits from the special edition, but also I think Coffee's character gets a little bit more rounding off. Um, but also there's a really small beat when, uh, there's so many things I'm probably going to forget but when the crane collapses and everything kicks off in the deep core and there's like fire going on and all this stuff and things are collapsing, water's pouring in a uh, monk, who is one of the Navy SEALs he gets trapped under underneath kind of a metal girder or something and Lindsay comes in and saves him and pulls him out now throughout the whole film he's like limping and he's kind of laid out and stuff and uh, I don't think you see why in the theatrical version to the point where I thought he was the seal who um, who was in the water in the, the moon pool, I think it's called, when the submersible falls on top of him and he puts his arms up and stuff. But I think that's the other guy who had kind of a, a kind of a bandage around his head and a little bit of blood trickling down. I think that's the case. So with the special edition, with just like a, I think it's like a seven or eight second edition, you see that he, uh, that she saved him. That's why he, his foot is fucked up. Because uh, I thought that his foot was fucked up because the thing fell on him, which doesn't make sense because it falls on top of his head. So it was a different person and I didn't get what really was going on. And there is a scene later on where I, I think that's only in the special edition. I'm not entirely sure where he says to Lindsay, thanks. 
And because he's part of the Navy SEALs, she just kind of doesn't reply and just walks off. So there are some things that I'm pretty sure that's not in the theatrical version because it wouldn't make sense because you didn't know that she saved him, technically. Anyway, I think that's the case. So, yeah, I, I didn't get this one entirely. Like, there's more research I could have done, I'm sure, about what, what Cameron prefers and everything. And certainly the aspect ratio thing, which I just, you know, I don't know too much about and I don't know what the original intent was or anything. But regardless, that was my thoughts on the special edition version of The Abyss. It's not quite my preferred version, I think, based, based on the ending. But there are some scenes that I think absolutely need to be in there. But, it, it, but again, even with all that stuff, and it might just be because I'm not as, as overly familiar with the film, so I'm not noticing, it's like, is that, is this, was this the theatrical version that I watched last week? I don't know. So I'm not entirely sure, but, you know, 30 new minutes of footage, and it doesn't quite feel like, you know, that it is, you know, and it's probably just because I've seen Aliens and Terminator 2 so many times that when I see the special edition versions, those new scenes really stand out to me because I, I've grown up with those films, watching them again and again and again. The Abyss, that never happened. So that's probably why it doesn't feel like to me there's 30 minutes of new stuff. But it is a more substantial thing where it's not like big scene here, big scene there, big scene there. It's like like 10 seconds here, like a minute there, a minute there, a minute there, a minute there. There's so much. Um, so again, 41 additions to the film or all minor alterations and changes. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial one. Um, by his standards anyway, in terms of the director's cuts that Cameron has put out there over the years. Anyway, mercifully, I'm going to end this video, and there's probably more I could talk about that I've forgotten about, but that's that's pretty much, in almost an hour, my thoughts on the special edition version of The Abyss. Well worth watching. Ending doesn't work for me as much as the theatrical, which again doesn't work that much for me either, and I really wish the ending of the film worked better, but I'm sure there are people who, who love the ending. Um, I, again, I don't know. I have no, I have no concept of that. So please let me know your thoughts and what you think of the abyss in in both of its versions and everything else in between. And I really hope the film gets a Blu-ray release or a 4K release soon because I, I feel like that the time is ticking. And well, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's not that there's a time limit on it, but there's also I just think that people are getting really fed up now with not having it and not being able to see it again in the best possible quality. And I've been reading things and there just seems to be no movement. And I think the Disney, I think I said that before, the Disney acquisition of 20th Century Fox has really put a kind of a block on that, which is really unfortunate. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, even, even if it was just Disney Plus releasing it in like, you know, in fork and they, they can release it in, in Ultra HD, that would be a really big selling point, I think, for a lot of people, maybe. So I don't know. And, and I'm assuming that they own now own the rights to Titanic, and I'm not sure about the Terminator movies. No, I'm mean, certainly not the first Terminator movie, not the, not even the second one, of course not. But he, so there's Aliens, The Abyss. I think he did True Lies. I'm forgetting some of these details now, but there's at least Titanic. They have Avatar on Disney Plus. I'm sure they could put Titanic on there, and I'm sure they could put The Abyss on there. It's just a matter of doing it, I suppose. And you know. Streaming is the future for a lot of these companies, and, and anything is an asset, I suppose, but even if we just got that, a way to watch the film in really great quality, I'd settle for at least that, and just for it to be part of the conversation again, you know, and so, because it just, it really is a film that people don't talk about much, because there's, there's no real great way to watch it in our current era and generation of home video. Um, for a lot of us, especially me, DVD is just a thing of the past, you know. A lot of people, they still stick with the DVD, and that's fine, but, um, you know, that's, I just don't think it's part of the wider conversation in a way that I think it probably needs to be, in a way that I would hope it would be, you know. So, yeah, The Abyss. Great film. It, it really, that's the thing, it's a great film, it just isn't, like, a masterpiece to the point where I want it to be, which is, which is kind of a shame, because then it's more about me and what I want it to be, and I don't know, I think that's not the right way to look at a film, I suppose, but, you know, I just because I love Cameron so much, I almost feel like it needs to be this five-star classic, and it isn't quite that. But it almost is, and that's the frustrating thing. I think with a great ending, this would be a five-star film for me, because there's so many... Again, as soon as the crane accident happens, the film just kicks into a, a different gear. And I love the the paranoia, I love the, the tension, I love the mood, I love the visuals. I think there's just so many great things about this film. And uh, I just hope that with with years to come, I will enjoy it more and more. Um, and it'll be a film I'd like to go back to maybe once every two years or so. 
and just immerse myself in that world. I think that, again, watching it for me three times in six months is a bit much for me unless I absolutely love the film. And in, even then, my absolute favorite films, I like to leave them a few years. You know, Back to the Future is one of my absolute favorite films of all time. I haven't sat down and watched it properly from bell to bell for about seven years, I think. And I like that, because then I know when I see it again, it's going to be, wow, you know, and I like that feeling. So it, it varies, but I, I tend not to watch films over and over again, even if I really love them. So with The Abyss, I'm almost kind of done with it at this point. But at the same time, I don't know, talking about it, I there's things about it I, I love and, and really appreciate. And um, and again, the acting, I think, is, is really good for the main three. Hippie, again, still stands out to me as just... No, there's just the certain bits where he just, his acting's not very good. Um, not so much in terms of like special edition scenes or anything, but just, just I don't know, just thinking about it again and seeing him, there's a certain, like when the, the rat gets like put in the water with the breathing fluid, and he's like, no, you, you're going to kill her. And I don't know, he, he clearly loves that rat, and, and they show that throughout the entire film. But when like, you know, your pet, that thing that you love is being like literally, you think, drowned in front of you, I think I'd do a bit more than just go, Oh, you're drowning her. Like, you know, he's kind of acting really scared and stuff, but it, I don't know. It's, I think it's a weird situation to be put in because he has to be held back and he's not allowed to get in and stop it. How do you make that work? And I think that it didn't quite, you know, it's just, it's an interesting scene. It's not nice to see the rat kind of struggling and being in distress, but I just think that if that was my cat, Lily, I would be pushing over anyone and everyone who was trying to do that to my cat, and I'd be like, you get the fuck off my cat. Like, I would go nuts. I would go ballistic if anyone tried to... Not that he's trying to harm the rats, but if I saw someone doing something that I think even put my cat in distress... Well, maybe not so much. If someone were... <laughs> if someone was putting my cat in, in kind of distress, I'd be really pissed off, but I wouldn't, like, do anything physically. But if I saw someone putting my cat in some water and, and she's, like, choking and stuff... And they're saying, no, it's fine, this is normal. I'd say, fuck your normal. And I would just I would just move mountains to kind of stop that from happening. So I just, I, I don't buy his, you know, and even at that point in the story, you don't know that he loves the rat as much as he does because he, he kind of, there's that great beat where he puts it in the plastic bag and later on the, the submersible is rolling around inside the deep core. There's water going everywhere and he needs to get out to the door, but the rat is behind. And so he's like, he pauses as if to say, right, Am I going to save myself or am I going to risk my life even more just to get my rat? And he goes for the rat, you know, and I, I like that. I, I like that part of the character. I like the, the beats where the rat is like just sitting on his headphones and stuff. And, and there are parts of his character that I do like, but, you know, he's a bit grating. And there are just a few scenes, like I said, about 30% of his scenes, I would say. I feel like I'm watching someone act and it's kind of, it doesn't drive, drive with the rest of the, um, the cast, I think. And one more thing, the character of Sonny. I kind of didn't even realize he was a character. <laughs> um, so there's there's a, a character called Sonny on the Deep Core crew. And he has kind of similar hair to Catfish. It, it's straighter than his, but he has a similar kind of mustache. Catfish has a full, fuller beard, I think. I thought they were the same character. <laughs> so there's a scene in the special edition when the accident has happened and, and Sonny is there and he's on the, he's trying to get through on the comms to the surface. And he's just like, man, I just want to see my wife again. Just one more time. You know, it was a really heavy moment. I just thought, oh, that that's not Catfish. And and suddenly I realized, oh, this is a whole other character that I kind of didn't realize was in the film. And I think their similar looks just didn't help things, you know. But, you know, I, I certainly, I can relate to not wanting to make every character look completely different for the sake of audience recognition. But I do think that, that Sonny's character is in periphery to the point where I actually thought that those two characters were the same. Anyway. On that note, I'll leave it there. I do love The Abyss. I wish I loved it even more. And I'm, I'm learning to live with it. Thank you for watching. And I will see you again mercifully in the next video.